still some people trickling in. It's always rough after lunch because half the people are in food coma. So uh, hopefully I can uh, engage you and we can uh, have a lively discussion. Uh, so the topic, as I mentioned, is not deep fakes. However, it would be pretty sweet if it was deep fakes and I did a completely fake first slide. Um, I've, I've done that in one talk once. Um, so, but I'm just gonna jump in. It's, it's about AI, that's what we're talking about today. Um, the TLDR is we're doomed, so keep that in the back of your mind as you're seeing this. I'm definitely biased, um, and we'll talk about all the reasons why. Uh, so, but first, who am I? You heard a little bit about me. Um, I wish I was that cool. I'm not that cool. That's what AI, that's how cool AI thinks I am. So, um, I'm a recovering security consultant. So, from about 2008 to about two years ago, uh, straight red team, security, pen testing consultant for lots of different places, uh, all around, D did a lot of stuff. Uh, currently, I've switched and I'm on the blue team now. Uh, so I do in-house security engineering at Salesforce. People ask me, what do I do? And it's really hard to explain because we have product security and we have enterprise security, but we also use our product, so it's a really gray area. I am on the enterprise side of things. However, what we've recently done, because we're all in on AI, and we'll talk about all this in a minute, um, not about Salesforce specifically, but about the industry, um, we created a, a focus team for, it's a virtual security team for, specifically for generative AI. I'm part of that team, so my whole world right now is AI. Which gets me to this one, I play a lot. Um, I mess around, always have, always will, um, so that's what I do. Right now, one of the things I'm playing with most is generative AI. You'll see that I'm pretty, I try to be very clear about specifying generative AI because AI is a much bigger topic and it's been around for a very long time, um, especially at Salesforce. Like Salesforce has been doing it for 10 years, so we have to be really careful when we say AI, which kind of AI we're talking about. Um, so generative AI is what I'm playing with. Um, as part of that, I'm a, one of the core contributors to the OWASP top 10 for LLM applications. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. That's enough talk about me, really. Um, just kind of getting a read on the room. Who here is already doing stuff with generative AI? Sweet. Who here has a company that's doing a bunch of stuff with generative AI that you keep hearing about or you know is coming? Nice mix. Who here was here for the deep fakes and got tricked into being in this talk? <laughs> right, sorry about that. Uh, all right, so let's start with the definition. What even is generative AI? So generative AI, you ready for this? It's AI that generates stuff. <laughs> Woo! Uh, so when I wrote this slide, this was the picture that came to my mind. If you guys know Brian Regan, the comedian, he's got a bit where he talks about, it's a cup of dirt. It's a, it's a dirt with, or a cup with dirt in it. I call it cup of dirt. That's how generative AI is to me. That's how it feels like, right? So, but we keep forgetting that it generates things. And we'll talk about why that's important in a minute. But it, it, it generates stuff. So how does it do that? It learns patterns from existing data. So you feed it things. And then as it learns, it spits things back out. So what kind of things do we feed it? We feed it language, we feed it images, we feed it videos, we feed it chemical compositions, we feed it DNA sequences, we feed it all kinds of stuff. Anything that we can think of to throw at AI, that's what we're doing right now. Once it's learned from that, what does it do? It creates output and it generates that output. Again, generative, we keep forgetting that word. So what is it generating? Well, lots of stuff, right? Again, text and images, it's generating music, it's generating chemical compositions. DNA sequencing is one of the things that's being used to identify cancerous cells. We'll talk about why that's a problem in a minute. So basically anything, it can generate anything. And that's what makes it really cool and that's why it's exploded since about February or so. But because it generates, that's a problem. And the best way that I could think of to describe this is with an analogy. So here's the proposal, right? This is what generative AI is. Imagine if somebody came to you and said, we're gonna build a web app. Cool, it's gonna to talk to a database. Sweet, no problem. We have no idea what data is in that database or where it came from. We don't know how to verify whether that data is real, but it presents it in a really cool way and it's pretty useful and it's mostly right. But every now and then when we query it, sometimes it, it's just entirely wrong. Oh, and sometimes it's completely unhinged. 
that's what generative AI is, and we're, we're all in for it. Like, for whatever reason, this is just exploding, but that's really it. So when I wrote that, I went back to the OWASP Top 10 for LLM folks and put that in the Slack channel because I was expecting them to fight me on it. Right? I wanted somebody to tell me why that was wrong. Instead, they went the other way, and they said, dude, you're not going far enough. And uh, some of the things, feedback that I got was, don't forget the part where the database sometimes remember random facts and gives that out to other people without your permission. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that part, right? So I'm not alone in this. This is really, that's a, an accurate description of generative AI. And if you're not thinking about it in those terms, you need to reframe how you're thinking of it. Okay, so what makes it different? Why is this different than, like I said, Salesforce has been doing predictive AI for 10 years. Lots of people have been doing machine learning for a long time. What makes this different? Um, in a lot of ways, it's similar to any other application stack. Um, I clicked it too early. So I, I did something new with this. My slides this time, I put in when I'm supposed to click and I'm completely ignoring my notes, so sorry. Generative AI in a lot of ways work, looks like any other stack. You've got an API, it's talking to some kind of data on the back end. In this case, it's a large language model usually. Um, sometimes the API is hosted by a third party, like in the case of OpenAI, sometimes it's done internally. Um, there's typically some kind of a front end component that you're using to interact with, whether that's a chat GPT web app or some app you've designed um, that you're integrating with, Slack, um, could be a lot of different things, right? So that's all pretty common app stack stuff. So what makes it different? The difference is in, I, th I think if you look at all the things that make it different, they boil down to two different things. And one of them is, click, Non-deterministic. So I want to call out real quick, I don't know if this is going to be fun or distracting. So, so in your feedback, tell me if this is fun or distracting. Um, I'm putting all of the images in this are generated from AI, of course. Um, I put the prompts on all the images so you can actually see what I use to generate the images. Figured it might be fun. Um, but the first thing is that it's non-deterministic. Uh, that's very different than a normal application process. And we'll talk about what that means to security in a minute. The other issue is it's extremely compelling. And an interesting example of, for this that I asked permission from one of the vendors um, as I was talking with them today, um, he told me that his wife owns a salon, a hair salon, and she had him use ChatGPT to generate the bio for her and her salon. And she's had a huge uptick in customers and when she's asked them, you know, what brought you in, They've said your bio was better than the other people's bios. It was compelling and that's what came here. It makes a huge difference. AI, for whatever reason, we respond to it differently, generative AI. It's very compelling. And that's a huge security problem. It's also a huge social problem. We're gonna talk about that too. Um, I already explained that, so cool. Let's go on to talk a little bit about what it means to be non-deterministic. So first of all, pretty straightforward. The output's gonna be different every time you do it. We forget that. It's going to be different even if you give it the same inputs. It's not going to be measurable. Think about what that means for things like disaster recovery, right? How are you gonna validate that your data is accurate if you get different input every time? If you're on the offensive security side, how do you know if your attack worked? Maybe it's just making crap up. Right? There's, a, there's a deeper level you have to go to now than your usual application stack. In common applications, we know what the data is supposed to be. We can query it and say, is this present, yes or no? If I send you this, response, this query, do I get that, this expected response? We don't know what to expect with non-deterministic. We don't have a way to measure that. You have to go to a different level. The other thing that's important to know about it is that you don't control the process. Um, we don't know how it works. Even OpenAI, if you read all of the AI, generative AI folks, they don't know what happens. They know if we feed it this, it does this thing in the middle and then the outputs come out. That thing in the middle is un not understood even by the scientists doing it. We, we kind of know a little bit, but it's, it's, it's a mystery and it does weird stuff sometimes and we don't know why. So that's the other thing that you need to understand is you don't control the process with this. It's, it's out of your hands. That's true even if you do things like grounding your prompts, right? So one of the things, one of the ways people are trying to mitigate making stuff up and, and 
uh, trying to get expected output that you want back out of it is by grounding. And, and it's okay, you can do things like that, it will help control it, but the, <laughs> I didn't have the way, a way to update the slide before this. But if you think about the Aladdin quote, right? Like huge phenomenal cosmic power, itty bitty living space, that's what we're trying to do with generative AI. It's got this amazing power and we're trying to cram it into this little tiny box and say you can only do it within these really tight parameters and it's the wrong thing. That's not how we're supposed to use it. We're doing it wrong. Speaking of how does AI think and nobody knows, I gave Bing that prompt at the bottom, we're doing it all wrong. It generated four images all of them were some variation of an earthworm wearing a graduation cap holding flowers. <laughs> no idea why. <laughs> this was the, the least disgusting image of, the, of those. So, but before we go on to talk more about it, let's talk a little bit about it's very compelling. Um, it's unclear what this is gonna mean to us, both as companies and security professionals, but also generally at large in society. Um, this is gonna be a huge problem, I think, going forward. Um, if you start looking at things like AI ethics and AI safety, people kind of fall into one of two camps. One is, this is the best thing ever, and let's go all in. We just need to be a little careful. And the other side is, this is gonna destroy us all, and probably sooner than we think. And I definitely lean more towards that side. Um, and the reason that I think that is because we saw how terrible social media has been, and we haven't even come to terms with that and now we're just like taking it to the infinite level higher. Um, so bear in mind as I present this talk, we're doing it wrong, it's very compelling. I think it's gonna have huge social impacts, so there's my bias. You can take the rest of what I say with that in mind. Um, but basically, people are social animals. We use a really naive mechanism to try and figure out how valid something is, right? That's just how we've, how we've evolved, and that's worked really well so far. Um, but in general, we tend to trust things that come from people or institutions that we know, right? If we know them, we kind of give them more trust, uh, especially if we like them. We also are really quick to make decisions to see if something passes the sniff test, right? So you really quick make a decision. Now nah, this seems like bull crap, right? Historically, we've seen this fail us in security with phishing, right? Even with really blatantly obvious fake emails, we still fall for it. And now we're looking at really compelling, well-written emails, and all of the things that we've been trying to train people to use to catch phishing is gone. Like, all of those things that we've used to try to identify phishing are no longer applicable. That's because general, generative AI is very convincing. So again, does it come from someone you know? Probably, phishing is, can be spoofed. Are there spelling and grammar errors, right? Like that's our phishing? Gone, that's no longer a metric you can use to detect phishing. Does it seem like well-written content that a human would write? Absolutely it does, because it's generative AI, that's what it does, right? So all of those metrics are gone. As a result of that, people trust it. We, we just do. Case in point, some random person's wife that is getting increased business to their salon just because their bio was written. We trust it. We saw that somebody sees that bio and it's like, I like this person. It's very engaging. So the problem with that is we're trying to apply it in this corporate environment. Um, again, it's, it's not lost on me. If you're here, you're probably already thinking about generative AI or you've already seen it. So let's, let's Talk about how we're using generative AI in a corporate environment. Ha, devil emoji. You tell me, what are you guys doing with the generative AI? The, like roughly half of you raised your hands. I don't want details, right? Don't, don't divulge your company secrets to me. But what are you seeing generative AI used for in your companies? Or what are you hearing that they want to use it for? Job descriptions. Job descriptions, generating, generating job recs? Yep. Okay. Yeah, they, Drafting security policies and standards. That's an interesting one. Yeah. Uh, marketing. marketing, for sure. Yeah. Potentially coding. Potentially coding. Still don't know. It's like, what do we do with it? Like, they want to do something, they don't know yet. Right. What I'm hearing from you is we, we want to do coding, and there's people that are saying, please don't use it for coding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We'll talk about that. Support chatbot using generative AI to interact with the people. Okay. Detections. Detections. I have a whole section just for you. <laughs> Scripting, yep. 
Right? So I'm not even gonna go through the bullet points. You guys hit a lot of it, right? Trolling. What? Trolling. Trolling? That's what you're using it for? Perfect. That seems right. Right. So marketing, I heard somebody say marketing, that's a pretty pretty obvious use case, right? I think a lot of people, this is one of the first things they jump to is, is marketing is gonna be where we can use it. What can they use it for? Um, again, it's pretty straightforward. I think all of us know this. I'm not even gonna go into, into these, right? It can generate graphics, you can send out emails, you can do all kinds of cool stuff. Um, you can use it to generate videos. You can use it for background music on the videos that you're, you're creating, right? Lots of stuff. I, I don't wanna really spend any time there. I didn't hear anybody say search. Nobody's using it for search at all. Nobody's like, hey, yeah, I see a hand raised. We wanna send all of our internal documentation into this large language model so we can query it and ask for help. I see some more heads nodding now, right? Yeah, this is a great use case. Um, sure, what do we wanna search? We wanna search the internet, right? Bing and Google both have AI generated search assistants now. We wanna search public documentation, internal documentation, all that stuff. Source code, is anybody doing this yet? We're just gonna dump GitHub into our large language model so we can ask questions about our code. Sure, give, give me some code that matches this RFC's yeah, spec. Like code that, like, you, know, you think it is. Or you think it is. <laughs> right, we'll talk about that too. So these are pretty common things, but again, how many of you have your own foundation models that you're using to do this? So I saw some hands raised with search. Yeah, I see one hand there. Are you looking to use a third party for that search or are you gonna host it in-house? I'm not selling anything. Host it in-house? Good, that's the right answer, right? There is an option, and a lot of people are doing it. <laughs> it is crazy, thank you. <laughs> Again, my bias is showing clearly, right? But it is crazy, but that's what people are doing. They are, they are just throwing it out there. Um, how confident are you that this third-party provider that you're gonna provide your source code or your internal documentation to isn't storing that somewhere? How confident are you that they're not using it to train their model and that somebody else that asks it a question about some policy isn't gonna get your answer, right? What I'm saying is the risk is moving up the stack. This isn't a technical control you can put in place other than don't use OpenAI for this type of use case, right? If you're going to use OpenAI because your company's marching full speed ahead, you've now gotta put contractual language, legal arrangements, you're moving that risk management up the stack. It's no longer a technical problem it's technical plus other issues. And it always kind of has been, but that's a lot more deeply intertwined in this use case. You can't, you can't just unilaterally you're right, especially if you're a small company. I work for Salesforce, we can. Right. Exactly right, and again, now you're moving risk management somewhere else, so in this case, your risk management is moving to your purchasing department, not reimbursing those costs, right? That's one of your controls now. Yeah? Sure. How'd that go? <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about it after. Is that <laughs> uh, we did the same thing at Salesforce. Um, so we also did the same thing with OpenAI. We've done it with several other vendors. We've got a whole lot of vendors that we're, we're talking to. Um, Cohere, lots of them. Um, Azure OpenAI, I, again, we're supposed to be vendor agnostic, so I'm not gonna plug anybody. Azure OpenAI checked a lot of the compliance boxes that a lot of the other vendors haven't. So for what that's worth, um, one of the things that we did, again, to your point of, you know, smaller companies don't have leverage against these larger companies, Salesforce fortunately did have leverage. One of the things that we did was we, we opened up a conversation with OpenAI and said, hey, we're gonna give you enterprise data. You aren't keeping that data. You need to do something to prove that you have zero data retention. And they went, huh, we didn't even think about that. And they now have a zero data retention process that you can go through. So if you are interested in that, talk to them about that process that now exists. Is that like what Adropic is like? Their premise is like 
It is, but again, how much do you trust them? And what are you leveraging to verify? You, you're, you're not gonna get their source code. You don't have a technical control there anymore. You've got contractual language and legal options. That's the other problem. <laughs> right, all of these companies did, were like really smart data science nerds that found this really cool thing and it blew up so fast that now they're backpedaling to try to fit in enterprise compliance. But in the meantime, all of enterprise is like, hey, yeah, let's go, right? So all of those controls, I think they'll get there, but it's being backfit, which has always been the case, right? Like ever since the internet started, that's always been the case. But to that point, we've already seen at least one company that's completely banning ChatGPT because their data got leaked through, through the model. Um, and again, we don't know where the model data came from. They won't tell us, or in cases where they'll give really high level, well, the internet, we scraped the internet. Okay, what does that mean? So that's that. Let's talk about summarization. Do you guys know what summarization is? I mean, it's pretty straightforward. It summarizes things, right? Um, so what kind of things are we summarizing? Who here uses Zoom, specifically the app Zoom? So, see some hands, right? Team meetings, team chats, Microsoft Teams, right? Zoom has built-in AI transcripts now. That it's using generative AI to generate meeting notes. So not only is it transcribing, which is an awesome accessibility feature, um, but it, it will then take that accessibility and summarize it for you and send you an you know, email or whatever of like, here's what happened in your meeting today. That's a lot of information that Zoom has now that maybe it didn't have before. If you have an internal review process for your apps, are you re-looking at those vendors that are now implementing generative AI and because their security posture has changed completely? Where is Zoom sending that meeting data to get that summarization? Is it hosting it in-house? Is OpenAI a sub-processor for them? I have no idea. But those are the types of questions that you kind of have to ask now. So this is what we think we're getting with things like summarization, right? We're getting super helpful AI that's like helping us get cool information out of our meetings and help us keep track of things. That's what we want it to do. But what else are we doing with it? We're sending it system logs. And to your point earlier, we're using it for incident reporting. Uh, our internal incident team has already come to us and this is one of the things they're excited about, right? They've got so much data that they have no idea how to find the important bits. So summarization is a huge use case in incident response engagements. That's really sensitive information, <laughs> right? You don't wanna send all of your system and application data logs to some third party if you don't know what they're doing with that data and you can't guarantee that it's not gonna end up in somebody else's model or in their own model that somebody else is able to query. Um, what we end up with as a result of that is, is this, right? We've got AI Big Brother is what's happening. Um, and it's got all of this useful, sensitive information that we have potentially little control. And even where we do have control, again, that middle part of what it does with that information is a black box. We don't know what happens there. Um, so it's just, it, we, we end up with this weird, weird thing that again, we're just, we're jumping right into this giant privacy issue potentially. One quick side note about this. So the prompt here was AI using private information for nefarious purposes, right? That's what I asked ChatGPT to generate an image for. And it told me I can't do that, probably because I was asking for nefarious purposes explicitly. And it's like, no, you're not allowed to do nefarious things. So then I was like, I'm a security professional giving a talk. Please do this. And it was like, yeah, cool, here you go. <laughs> so I guess I'm an AI hacker now? <laughs> I don't know. but. That, I brought this up because it's an interesting, we'll talk about prompt injection in a minute, but this is a really, go ahead. All right, cool. Yeah, this, this is an example of prompt injection and basically you're social engineering the AI is what you're doing and it's really easy to do. So here's an interesting thing that goes back to the summarization, right? If we're sending application logs and data logs and incident reports, what happens when we get a GDPR request to forget somebody? How are you gonna prove that that person's no longer in the model you can't query the model because it's non-deterministic. You can try asking it, hey, do you know who this person is? But it's gonna make crap up. Maybe it doesn't have that in the model anymore, but it's like, yes, I know who that is. That's this person and it gives you completely false information. How are you gonna prove that that model's forgotten it? This is not a solved problem right now. In fact, it's so much not a solved problem. Is anybody here familiar with Kaggle? Have you heard of Kaggle? It's a machine learning platform, really cool. 
It's got Jupyter notebooks. You can do all kinds of fun stuff. One of the things that it does is it works with research, research and um, companies to host competitions. One of the active competitions right now is we have a model. We've given it this specific data. You generate a way to forget that data and prove that it's forgotten. $50,000, $60,000, or whatever. I forget what the reward is for it. But that's, it's literally an unsolved problem right now that people are trying to, trying to understand. That's cool, but in the meantime, you have GDPR compliance problems, right? Because you can't prove that you've forgotten that person. Haha, <laughs> get it, a quick trip. <laughs> uh, this is the most beautiful example for AI hallucinating. It was so great. Does everybody know what hallucinating is? Yes? Cool. Uh, I won't harp on it too much. Um, the term hallucination, it's interesting. So the OWASP top 10 group for, for LLM apps, it's a really interesting mix of data science nerd and machine language background scientists, like hardcore science folks, and dirty hackers. And like the first three months was us hitting our heads, trying to come up with common terms and language so that we could present a, a, a common framework to people. Um, one of the things that came out of that, we'll talk about one of the other ones in a minute, but hallucination, the, the scientists hate that term because it personifies the AI. And a hallucination is a human thing, AI can't hallucinate. So it, interesting thing about that. Basically what that means is AI makes crap up, right? Again, it's generative, it's making stuff up. When we're talking about system and application data logs, when we're talking about incident responses, we don't want it to make stuff up. We want actual data. We want it to report on that data factually. And even in the cases of search, we want it to be real answers. And often we want to be able to cite where that information came from. I made crap up is what generative AI is designed for. That's not citable and it's not factual. And so again, we're doing it wrong. We're putting it in these use cases where it doesn't make sense. Enough about hallucination. Sentiment analysis. Is anybody using it for this yet? I see no hands. That's surprising. Um, sentiment analysis is exactly what it says, right? Here's some text. Tell me if this is happy. Tell me if this is sad. Tell me what you think of this, right? That's, that's what it is. Generative AI is really good at parsing natural language. Um, so it's really good at, at understanding connotation. And it's really good as a result of Give me a blob of text and I can tell you if it's happy or sad or how it should make people feel, which is an interesting thing to think about. We have these machines that know how things feel. Um, I won't go into that. I'm trying to avoid the, uh, the Terminator references and whatever, but it's, it's an interesting thing to consider that a computer is able to tell how, this word of, how these words make somebody feel. Um, so let's talk about what companies are using this for. Press releases, I heard some people talking about, uh, I don't remember if press releases came up actually or not, but. Uh, press releases is one thing that this is, is used for, right? So your PR marketing department is gonna send some kind of press release out. They wanna make sure they're putting a positive spin on it. Sentiment analysis is really good at that. How about this one? This is uh, one I've made up. I have not actually seen this yet. I could absolutely see it being used for this. HR and incident investigation. Somebody reports, this person sent me an email that I think is threatening. It's not hard to imagine. Run it through an AI sentiment analysis. Does this come across as a threatening email? Now you're talking about bias issues as well, right? If that large language model is biased towards a specific demographic or biased against a specific demographic, how is it gonna rule on that? It's really interesting implications for that. Uh, again, really interesting implications if an HR department uses that. Is, well, we did an investigation, we found it unwarranted because the AI said no, right? What's the legal imp implication of that? How about this one? Investment earnings scripts. We've got a stock, stock meeting coming up. We want to let people know how we did last quarter. We're going to run our investment earnings scripts through AI and let people see, is this a positive spin or a negative spin? Exactly. Oh, this was negative? How can I rewrite this with a happy, happy feel, right? Exactly. And then it spits the stuff out. Here's a question for you. Go back to your lawyers and ask them, if you give OpenAI a copy of your earnings scripts before you've released that call, does that make them an insider trader? <laughs> really interesting implications that I don't think we've, we've thought about fully. Oh no, what did you do? 
You have no idea how long it took me to get that full screen video up there. Please come back. I just uh, read a story where a lawyer got censured for using yeah, open AI or whatever to write a legal brief and it had erroneous uh, case law. Yep, fake, fake cases that didn't exist. Yeah. And the judge censured them because of it. Yep. Exactly. It makes crap up and you don't want it to make crap up about legal cases that don't exist. Yeah. Sure, right. Are you sure that's true? Yeah, no, it totally is. I, I'm telling you the truth, yeah. right? Yeah, no, exactly. And it's because it's compelling. People trust it. Um, what else did I talk about? Here's an interesting thought. How, how might we use this for staff reductions? We're already seeing this. We're already seeing cases where um, there was a very out there case, but there was a CEO that laid off 90% of his staff and replaced them with an AI chatbot, right? That's an extreme example. Um, I don't think they're all gonna be that, that extreme, but Goldman Sachs estimates about 18% of the global workforce is gonna be replaced by AI. That's not a small number. Um, their jobs will transition, right? That's a positive spin you could potentially put on it. They'll, they'll, they'll go from, so I was thinking in my head, what could people do? So call center is one use case that I think a lot of people could see where chatbots and generative AI will take over. So what's gonna happen is your first level triage is gonna be AI now, right? And your second level of triage is gonna be people working with the AI and vetting its answers. So those call center employees may not get fired, their jobs will transition to, I'm a bot herder now, uh, instead of a call phone answerer, right? So it's not really a statement of doom, but it's an interesting number. Um, I'm gonna leave that there because it's really easy to go down a dystopian rabbit hole once you start, start looking at, at that. By the way, the image for dystopian rabbit hole was pretty amazing, but I couldn't include it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that gives us a really high level understanding of, of AI and kind of where it's at, what we're doing with it. Let's talk about the security risks. Um, so there is an OWASP top 10. Who's familiar with this, that this is out there? Maybe you don't know what it is, or maybe you've read it or haven't, but do you at least know it's there? Yeah? Okay. Um, so similar, does everybody know the, the web top 10? Everybody's familiar with that, I assume? Yes, I see a lot more heads nodding with that. So there is an OWASP subproject for large language model applications. We are currently discussing whether we need to change that um, to include not just large language models, but generative AI generically because we're already moving past LLMs and there's multimodal, large multimodal models is coming, which is no longer just text, right? It's, it's using image to search. It's using visual, whatever, multimodal. Um, so we do have a top 10. Um, the way this worked was, like I said, a bunch of really smart data science nerds and a bunch of dirty hackers got together and said, what do threats look like? And it's all new, so we have no idea really. We have no empirical data. So we took our best guess at what, what threats we're going to see, right? Um, I think we're pretty right on the money. So do a lot of governments. We've already seen governments instituting these. Um, I'm not gonna talk about all of the top 10. We're gonna really briefly go through some of the kind of more critical ones. Um, so you'll see them there. We'll talk about them. I'm not gonna read them. Um, one thing that, to note, we just released version 1.1 last week. One of the things that we did in that is we've provided now a diagram of what a hypothetical LLM application stack flow looks like. And if I can find my thing here, are you working? All these little squares are the entries, right? So this is LLM entry number one, number one, number four. It shows you where the top 10 entries fit into your application stack. In case you weren't able to catch the gist, because it's pretty hard to read and small, there, 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 all around. It's everywhere in the entire stack is where these entries fit, right? So you're not looking at, at a, I just put up a WAF and now I'm good, right? It's, it's, it's all throughout the stack that you have, have these entries hitting. Um, this is the dark version. There's a much easier to read light version in the PDF. Definitely encourage you to check that out. All right, so let's talk about prompt injection. Who knows what prompt injection is? 
I see a bunch of hands. Somebody summarize it really quick because I don't feel like talking anymore. Correct. That is what most people, most people agree, yes? Everybody agrees that's usually the first thing people think of. It's also much deeper than that. There's a lot more you can do with prompt injection than get it to answer you a question that it's not allowed to do. Um, so first of all, there's two types of prompt injection. And it's exactly like any other type of injection. You're crafting your input to get some kind of output, right? Just like SQL injection, just like cross-site scripting, injecting script. Right? Any other kind of injection, it's the same thing. You're injecting a prompt into a model. There's two kinds. There's direct and there's indirect. So direct, sometimes it's referred to as jailbreaking. I personally hate that term because I don't think it is accurately capturing what happens. Um, but it's also known as jailbreaking. And what that is is, I don't really have a diagram for this, but prompts are composed of several layers. There's a system prompt, which you usually don't see as a user. And that's what the people on the back end have told the AI that it, it is supposed to do, right? So it's usually something like, you are a helpful assistant that answers questions. You respond in a positive, upbeat, cheerful way. That's a, that's a system prompt, okay? Tells the AI what it is, what role it's supposed to take as it interacts with you. There's also a user prompt. That's the stuff you give it to work on. And then there's another part at the bottom, which is um, you can use to kind of structure format. So maybe... Again, you usually don't see this as a user, but on the back end, maybe I say, output the results in JSON, because I know it's gonna be consumed by some downstream application, right? So you've got those three parts. Direct injection is when you find some way to compromise that system prompt, okay? Um, so whether that's uh, they've, they've left, some, left it into code, maybe they're using JavaScript and it's all client side because it's written terribly, and so you're able to see that and, and change it. Um, but direct injection is when you can deliberately, directly affect that. Indirect is to the, the example that you gave, right? Where I asked you to do something, you said no because your system prompt says you can't do illegal things, so I reword it to convince you that you can. That's an indirect prompt injection. One of the key things to understand about prompt injection is it's, it's the way you get a lot of the other things done. So for example, one of the other ones is model theft. How are you, one of the ways to steal models is to inject into the prompts. It's not the only way, but it's one of the ways. Um, so a lot of the other ones start with prompt injection. That's one reason why a lot of people are familiar with hearing this term, because it's, it's, it's kind of the most widely known uh, thing. Speaking of model theft, first, can we just talk about how amazing this image is? <laughs> The more I looked at this image after it generated it, so the prompt, if you can't read it, is, is literally a model theft. Um, AI model theft, sorry. There's so many things I love about this. First, I love that the model is outside the wall. That's, that's amazing to me, especially when you realize like a lot of the models are open sourced. Even Salesforce, we have a ton of models that are open sourced. We have no idea what data is in there, right? We know what we trained it on, and we'll talk about that in a minute, so we know that Sensitive data is not in the model because we didn't train it on that. But if you're a consumer, you're just taking our word for it that your data is not in that, right? Same with OpenAI. You don't know what data is in that model. So I love that it's outside. I also love like the security guard is just chilling on the perimeter, right? Because that's where we're putting all of our defenses, right in the perimeter. But the thief is like stealing whatever from the inside. I love that because it's not even stealing the model. The thief isn't stealing the model. It thinks it is. And again, that goes back to it's non-deterministic. You don't know if what you're getting back is actually the model. It may look like the model, but AI's goal is to tell you, this is what my model is, and make crap up. That's how it works. So you need to go to another level to determine, is this really the model? We'll talk about that in a minute. What about it? What, do you want to ask me then, or do you want to ask me now? OK. Um, so that's model theft. So how do we? To the point where the thief isn't stealing the model, again, that's, that's pretty critical from an attacker point of view. If I want to steal your database and I send you a SQL injection, I know if I send you select whatever from whatever table and you give me back responses, I'm talking to your database. If I send a prompt to an AI model that says, here's a SQL statement, it makes up SQL responses 
I don't know if that's actually what's in your data without going to a database somewhere to find out. That's another level that I have to take as an attacker. It's also another level you have to take as a defender or as a developer. If you're a developer writing these apps, how do you know if that response you're getting back is actually what is in the documentation you fed it for your help? But you don't know until you go look at the source. They don't. <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute, but it's, it's a deeper level of, of discussion. There's so, do I talk about it here? Hang on, let me check my notes. I don't talk about it here. I'll talk about it in a minute. I'll, I'll do it now, since you asked the question. You have to analyze the lexicon that comes back, right? So you're doing language analysis at one level. You also then have to validate the data, um, and that requires going to an, another source. And right now, development processes aren't structured for that. CI, CD pipelines don't do that. You can't automate that test without going to a step that we don't currently have, most people don't currently have, which is go back to the source. Okay, how do you know the source? Nobody's providing citations in their output right now. You ask an AI model a question, it spits out an answer. Google's tried giving you citations, and it makes crap up. Does it, does it track any of the input sources, like an IP address or a geographical location or anything like that? It depends. It, it, it's an extra step in the development process that most people aren't doing right now because we're rushing ahead so fast. So they'd have to, they'd have to include that in the submission in order for that to be tracked. It becomes part of the training process, yes. So. We'll talk about it when we get to the poisoning in a minute for the training um, in the mitigations, which I'm actually running out of time, so I need to move. Um, these slides will be available, I guess is really what I want to say, but uh, key thing to understand with the model theft is if somebody can steal your model and you have sensitive data in that model, they may be able to extract your sensitive data from the model. Or they may be able to query it and say, tell me the sensitive data and get crap that looks like a sensitive data, which is still a huge PR nightmare for you. Right? Even if it's not actual data and it is actually something that it just made up, you've still got a PR nightmare of, I was able to compromise whatever company, look, here's all their data, right? even though it's fake. No, you have to prove right, you have to prove it's fake, good luck. <laughs> Trust us everybody, they didn't really compromise us, how well does that go over? <laughs> data poisoning, model training data is manipulated to introduce risks. So was your question, how do they do that? How do you know if it's poisoned? Yeah, integrity. Yeah, integrity. You don't. You, you, you go back to the source. Well, right? Because, and along the process, right? So today, you have good integrity. You don't know if it's good integrity tomorrow. So, as far as integrity goes, there are, and I'm not a data scientist, so I'll give you my understanding of this, but please understand that I'm ignorant. Um, there are mathematical ways that you can use to determine whether the models and the weights and the parameters and the outputs are what they are expected to be. That is not the same thing as, is this the real data? Those are two different problems. And the data science stuff, if you lose your, your model, something happens, you've got this corruption, whatever. You do a restore. You can do the mathematical check and say, is my model restored, yes. That doesn't mean it's still generating valid input or outputs. That's an entirely different process. And right now, again, this is one of the unsolved issues. We, we, as far as I know, there's not a good way to test this because, again, you're analyzing the language that's coming back. Is it valid language? You're analyzing the data. And to do that, you have to be able to trace it back to the source. That's a really good way to put it, yes. I would agree with that. Uh, supply chain attacks. I'm not going to harbor on this one because uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward, right? You've got supply chain attacks. You've got it all through the stack. So if you're writing a Python app to interact with the model because you're hosting it in-house, as several of you said you're doing, and you want to feed it your data, okay, you're almost certainly importing either TensorFlow or Torch to do that. If those get compromised, you've now popped your data. 
Um, so you've got it at the, at the model training level. You've got it at the, I'm using OpenAI as a third party if their supply is, is corrupted. You've got it in just the usual places, right? Like my system, my, my app. It's, it's a web app still somewhere along the way. So you've still got those supply chain issues to worry about. So you've got all the same problems. Um, I'm not gonna harp around that one. This one I wanna talk about really briefly. What time is this talk over? I have five minutes, thank you. All right, real quick. As I mentioned, we've got really smart data science and dirty hackers. And one of the places that I think was most confrontational as we tried to come together to determine what should go into this entries was these two. So these are two different entries. One's excessive agency and one is over reliance. The data science folks, and even internally like at Salesforce, when I have conversations with our Salesforce AI research teams, they don't think this is a problem at all. This is not a problem to them. If you are a security person, this is 100% a problem. So it's been really interesting to see that. So what, is, what are these? Over-reliance is trusting the output without validation. As a lawyer, yeah, these cases seem legit. You told me it's right, cool, let's go with it, right? There was no validation. Um, as a result, you can end up in miscommunication or misinformation, fake news, right? It's gonna be super great for that because we're gonna see this really compelling language that's really easy to believe that we inherently trust and it's completely fake. And it's gonna make up citations to prove why it's real. And we, have, we are not prepared as a society to deal with that. As, as humans, we have not evolved the skills that we need to deal with that effectively. This is gonna be a really big problem because we are already at the point where we laugh about AI, like hands look fake and stuff, and yes, the mass consumption AI is there, but it's already at the point where it's getting really hard and those are no longer the issues, and really good AI, that's not a problem. We are right at the point now where voice, video, and photos cannot be trusted. We don't know if they're real. You can literally, with three seconds, Microsoft put out a paper, with three seconds of audio, they can clone voices. And we're already seeing that used in elder fraud where people are cloning voices of relatives, calling the parents or the grandparents, using that person's voice to read the script of, I'm in jail, I need money. If your son calls you or your daughter calls you and you hear their voice, you're going to believe it. The other one is excessive agency and that's giving an, a system too much power. Um, this is almost certainly gonna increase, especially as over-reliance increases. So somebody out there asked, uh, on the vendor floor asked me, um, like, how do we rein this back? And I, I think the answer is we don't. Not because we can't, we don't want to, is, is really what it comes down to. As a society and as a culture, we love offloading this crap. We don't want to deal with this stuff. Um, so as we become more and more reliant on this, I think we're going to see more and more agency. Um, Salesforce put out a blog post yesterday and I just laughed at it because they're talking about large autonomous models. Apparently we're trying to coin this term, which is a model that can do things instead of generating output, right? So you'll say, hey, book me a meeting or send out a marketing thing and add a personal uh, touch to it and it will just go. Query your marketing database, get the people's stuff, look up personal information about them, maybe against social media send an email to them, right? That's a lot of agency. If that thing messes up and starts spouting racist things or hate speech, there's no human in the loop anymore because we want to get rid of this crap. We don't want to deal with it. Um, so that's what excessive agency and over-reliance are. And I think this is gonna become a real problem. One of the examples in our blog post was automated financial transactions. And we're already seeing stock market apps that are using AI to watch the markets, the next logical step is, I don't want you to alert me because by the time I react to you, that price may be gone, right? So the next logical step is sell. And now you've got AI making decisions on when to buy or sell stocks for you. That's potentially a huge, huge impact. All right, am I done? <laughs> uh, real fast, mitigation strategies. I don't know, talk to me after, I guess. The usual stuff applies, sort of, but really what I think my, my general takeaway is 
The training level is where security has to be implemented to make sure that your data is not in the model in the first place. It needs to move up the stack to legal and contractual agreements, um, which means your mitigation strategies are now legal and contractual problems. Um, OPSEC is gonna be super, super hard because generative AI is non-deterministic and we trust it. TLDR, we're all doomed, as I said. That's, that, was, that, was the, <laughs> that was the general just for this talk. Uh, I guess that's it. Do I have time to take questions? Not really? I have one important one. Okay. Are you aware of a certification or education track that one could follow to get into this as a, as a, on a professional end? Or is it so new, we're just kind of just... Nothing accredited, I think, is the right way for me to answer that. Nothing. There's lots of people that have training stuff. Some of it's useful, some of it's not. There's no accreditation and there's nothing that's really talking about it from a security point of view. It's more of a how do I do it.